Okay, now if you remember last time we were in Mark, um, which was a couple of weeks ago now, we did the first half of the chapter, so we'll just pick straight up uh, where we left off, verse number 32. So Mark chapter number 14 and verse number 32. Said, uh, and, and thanks, Doug, for covering in the week when I was away. That was good. Verse number 32. It says, And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he saith to his disciples, Sit ye here while I shall pray. So Jesus tells his disciples, Look, sit and wait while he's going to go and pray. And, and this, this is not an unusual thing. You know, I mean, throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus taking the time to pray, often before like some important event. Um, for example, keep your finger in Mark. 14, but look at Luke chapter number 6. Look at Luke chapter number 6 and verse number 12. Luke chapter number 6 and verse number 12. It says, And it came to pass in those days that he, this is Jesus, went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. So he goes out and he prays. I mean, we sang before, sweet hour of prayer. Well, this is a sweet night of prayer. Jesus prayed all night to God. But then look what happens the next day. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom also he named apostles. And it goes through and lists them. So notice, before he chose the twelve apostles, what did he do? He spent the night in prayer to God. And so we can see that before something important happened, he spent a lot of time in prayer. You know, um, before, he, before he went out to preach, I mean, you can look at the start of the Gospel of Mark, before he goes out to preach in the towns and villages, once again, in fact, I think it's, have a look, I think it's Mark chapter number one, that... Um, mm. Yeah, so near Mark chapter number 1, verse number 35. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place, and there prayed. And Simon and they that were with him followed after him. And when they had found him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. And he said unto them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth. So before he goes out and preaches, he goes and he spends time in prayer. And so it's, it's, it's a good example for us to follow Jesus' example. That's why it's important. When we go out soul winning, what do we do? We pray. Before we go out, we pray. You know, when we finish someone, we pray for the people we've given the gospel to because it's God's power that we need. Okay, now in this case, back in Mark chapter number fourteen, Jesus is preparing to be betrayed by Judas. You know, he's preparing to give his life for the sins of the world, and so this is an important occasion that's coming up, and that's why he's spending this time travailing in prayer. Look at verse number thirty-three, Mark chapter number fourteen, verse thirty-three, and he taketh with him Peter and James and John, and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. So Jesus takes some of his closest disciples to pray with him. You know, when times are difficult, we should pray for each other. We should pray with each other. It's important that we, that we share. We, we, you know, we've got burdens when we've got troubles. We should, you know, obviously share them with God. I mean, the Bible says, you know, cast all your care upon him, for he careth for you. So let God know. But we should also pray for one another. We should let each other know um, of the troubles that we have. I mean, look at the, you can see the example um, throughout the scriptures. Look, for example, at 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5 and verse number 25. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5 and verse number 25. We see Paul says, Brethren, pray for us. Pretty simple, isn't it? Yes. Brethren, pray for us. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3. And verse number 1, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as with you. So he's saying, pray for us, and he's saying specifically pray that the word of the Lord may have free course. In other words, that we're going to be able to preach the gospel. That's specifically what he's asking for. He's praying. It says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, it says, pray for us. Actually, turn to Ephesians chapter number 6. Ephesians chapter number 6. And here we can see, because a lot of people when they read the Bible, like, they kind of think, you know, you, you see someone like the Apostle Paul, and he seems like some sort of superhero. He's out there just doing all these great things for God. But we need to realize that Paul knew that he needed people to pray for him. And repeatedly he's asking people. Look at um, Ephesians chapter number 6. Look at verse number 13. This is a very famous account. You know, that talks about the, the armor of God. And it says in verse number 13, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. So it's saying, look, because there's an evil day coming, you need to have this armor on. So you can you can stand, so you'll be able so you won't fall. Okay? And he says, look, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And so we see all these different pieces of armour. And some people think, well, okay, that's all that's it, you know, that's 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 the, the, the armour that Paul says to put on. But he doesn't stop there. He says Praying always, yeah. with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. 
and watching there unto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And then see what he says in verse 19. And for me. So he's saying, look, praying, but he specifically wants them to pray for him. And what does he want them to pray? And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So Paul was praying that I would be able to open my mouth boldly, that I would be able to utter the gospel, which is what I'm supposed to be doing. And he's saying, please pray for me. So look, if Paul needed people to pray for him, don't you think that we need to be praying for each other? Absolutely we do. Okay, look at the end of um, verse number 33, back in Mark 14. Look at verse number 33. He also said, um, so he took them and he began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. So Jesus was sore amazed and heavy. So, saying He was basically, he was troubled. He was weighed down. I mean, we might use the word, rather than saying someone's heavy, I mean, today if we say oh, someone's heavy, it kind of means they're, you know, carrying a bit extra. But no, when it says that Jesus was heavy, that's basically, we probably use the word depressed. Because yeah. it's like, you know, think of, it's, like, it's like there's a weight that's pushing down. Okay, he, that, that's what the heaviness is being spoken of. So, I mean, do you ever feel down about things? Yeah. You know, do you, do you ever sometimes feel depressed and down? Don't feel strange, because look, Jesus, he was heavy. He was heavy, you know, and, and we understand, because it's a normal human feeling. And of course, Jesus, the Bible says, was tempted at all points, like as we are, yet without sin. Okay, so it's not a, it's not a sin to be depressed. It's not a sin to be down. Okay, it's a normal human feeling. In fact, throughout the Bible, there are lots of examples of people who were depressed, and they even wanted to die. I mean, Jeremiah, for example, he's, he's called the weeping prophet. Why? I mean, he wrote a whole book called Lamentations, you know, and he talked about his eyes running down with tears. You know, um, Elijah, you know, he went through times of depression. I mean, he had times, I mean, in fact, I think it was just after he had the, the sort of mountaintop, mountaintop experience. After that, you know, remember he called down fire from heaven and, you know, destroyed the prophets of Baal and all that. It's like, great! Yeah. But then what happened in the next chapter, all of a sudden it's like, he's by himself, you know, and he wants to die. And, so, and that's the thing, is we need to realise, feelings go up and down. You know, we need to realise, as humans, our feelings are going to go up and down. Now, hopefully they don't go, you know, to extremes, okay? But it's still, it's going to happen. If you're really feeling really up, that's great. But realise that tomorrow you might not feel as good. And that's okay, because if you're feeling bad tomorrow, well, guess what? The next day, you might feel better. And so it's important we don't let our feelings rule what we're going to do or what we're not going to do. We should do what's right regardless of how we feel about it. You know, I mean, sometimes, I mean, and especially maybe, maybe when people are younger, they can sometimes be more susceptible. But at any stage of life, it can be like that. You can hear of someone and things that, you know, maybe something bad happens, you know, maybe they, they break up with a boyfriend or a girlfriend or some, some sort of personal thing happens and it's like, it's the end of the world. Yeah. You know, and the thing is, if you could look back, you know, years later, you know, decades later, and you, and you look back and think, well, I, hey, look, I end up marrying this wonderful woman or this, this wonderful man, and I, and I look back and think, boy, am I glad that that happened. Yeah. But at the time, it's like, oh, it's just so, it's just so sick. But no, we need to realise, we have ups and we have downs, and it's okay, it's perfectly normal to feel down. Now, getting to the stage where, I mean, some, in fact, even Moses was like this. Moses got to the stage where he was down, in fact, he even asked God to kill him, yeah, right. you know? Yeah. And so, that's not something that we should be doing. We shouldn't be getting in the stage of actually, you know, killing yourself, I understand, that is wrong, okay? Um, why? Because we're made in the image of God. It's wrong to, you know, murder someone else, or guess what, it's wrong to murder yourself. So that's not something we should do, but interestingly, when people get in that sort of situation, what you normally find is what they're doing, is they're focusing on themselves. If you've done, if you've talked to someone who's really wrapped up in depression, yeah. and they're really down, and it's like, whatever you say to them, you just, you can't seem to bring them out, but what do they talk about? It's about me. It's about how I'm feeling this, about what I'm going through. It's all about me, me, me. And so one of the things that can help to get out of depression is think about someone else. Think about what you can do to help other people. You know? I mean, the Bible says that we're supposed to esteem others, you know, better than ourselves. We're supposed to put the needs of others before our own needs. And when you have that sort of outward focus, you know, you want to, you want to not feel depressed, how about this? Go out and preach the gospel. Go out and preach the gospel. Put aside your needs, what you feel like doing. You feel like, you know, having a feed and sitting up and you know, relaxing on the couch or whatever. Yeah. But instead, think, hey, look, I'm going to go out and have my feet shown with the preparation of the gospel of peace and go out and preach the gospel to someone. Give someone the hope of heaven. Yes. Go and do that. Do you know what? You won't feel depressed anymore. No. You won't feel depressed, okay? Get out and, and have that focus on someone else. Anyway, let's continue on. Verse number, um, verse number 34. And he saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here 
and watch. So Jesus, he was clearly feeling extremely troubled. He was sorrowful, even to the point of death. And what does he say to his disciples? Wait and watch. Wait and watch. And when he says that, that actually includes prayer. If you look, there's a parallel account in um, Matthew chapter number 26. And in Matthew chapter number 26, we can see the same, the same thing. Keep your finger in, in, in um, Mark 14. But in Matthew 26, in verse number 38, the parallel passage, it says here, Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry here and watch with me. Oh, I've written down the wrong one. Uh, oh, never mind. But one of it does talk about, talks about watching and praying. I did write it down, but I've, I've written down the wrong reference. Never mind. And so, but here's the thing. He, he's wanting them to wait, to wait and to watch and to pray. Look back at uh, Mark chapter number 14. Mark chapter number 14, look at verse number 35. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. So Jesus, he goes forward, he falls down, he's got an attitude of submission. He's got an attitude of submission. He's falling down before God. Don't need to turn there, but in Psalm 95 verse 6 it says, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. And notice also in this verse, did Jesus want to go through what was going to happen? Did he want to go through what he was going to have to go through? No, he says, look, if possible, he asked that the hour might pass from him. You know, and it's interesting seeing this. It doesn't sound like Jesus believed in, in, pre, you know, in, in, in predetermination. Everything was predetermined. No, he says, look, if it's possible, if it's possible, let this hour pass. That's what he's saying. Look at verse number 36. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. So notice here Jesus addresses God as Abba, Father, which is a, it's kind of a familiar form of address, as opposed to um, sort of a, a more formal way of saying Father. In fact, it's actually still used today. Many Muslim families will use this, this term today, referring to like a, a familiar term for someone's father. In fact, um, Doug's missing verse that he was talking about a week ago. Um, this is, it's got Abba, Father here, but his one was actually Romans 8. And verse number 15, Romans 8 verse 15, must be the trial around the other way. And he says, but he says, for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So here Jesus is saying, Abba, Father, but according to Romans 8 15, we cry, Abba, Father. We can approach God boldly. Why? Because he is our Father. He's, he's our Daddy. He's, a, he's our Father figure. It says in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16, Hebrews 4 16 says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So if you're going through a difficult time, if you've got a time when you need things, wouldn't it be great to have someone, a father, that you can call upon that's actually going to help you? Okay, And that's, that's exactly what we do have. Now Jesus here though, he is still asking if it's possible that he wouldn't have to go through the ordeal ahead. That's what he's saying, if possible. But notice he does it with an, a, a submissive attitude. He says, not my will, but thine be done. In other words, I would rather not go through this, but whatever you want. Why? Because you know what's best, God. You know what's best. And that's the attitude he had. That's the sort of attitude that we should have. Look at verse number 37. And he cometh, so after this time of, of praying, talking to God the Father, and he cometh and findeth them sleeping. And saith unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldst not thou watch one hour? So Jesus' prayer, obviously it was longer than it seemed at first glance, because what happened? Peter, James, John, what have they done? They, they fall asleep. Instead of staying and praying, when he said watch, you know, that's what he's wanting them to do. He says, couldn't you watch one hour? Now here's the thing, try praying for an hour and see what it's like. Yeah. Try praying, I mean, if you get up early in the morning and try praying for an hour, you might, or maybe late at night you try praying for an hour, you might fall asleep. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so um, what my suggestion is, it's one of those things you want to maybe build up to. You know, start praying for five minutes. That'd be a good time. Sit, you know, sit your stopwatch and pray for five minutes. Set a time to pray for five minutes. Do that every day. Then pray for ten minutes every day. Every single day, pray for ten minutes. You know what? You do that, yeah. in the course of a week, you prayed for more than an hour. Yeah. Okay? And that, that, all, that all adds up. It makes a difference. Something you can help when you're praying for longer periods of time. You can write your prayers in a journal. Have, have, a, have a journal where you write your prayers down. You know? Um, I remember Debbie, she used to do that. Yeah. She'd write her prayers down. You know, and she, she, she read something out to me one time and, and, and said to Maureen, it's like she was really getting in touch with God. Yes. You can, it can really focus. It can focus your mind. Have a journal, write it down. And 
one of the things is you can actually look back and it'll help you focus. But you can also look back and see when your prayers have been answered. You know, hey, this is what I was praying for six months ago. This is what I was praying for a year ago. And look what's happened. Who would have believed that that had happened? Okay? Um, in fact, when you actually look at you, and say, well, I find, would find it hard to pray for now. Well, a good thing to do is to look at examples of prayer in the Bible. Look at examples of prayer and pray. You know how the Bible talks about praying in the Spirit? Well, what do you think that is? Praying in the Spirit. Jesus said, the words I speak unto you, they are Spirit and they are life. So when we're praying, when we pray God's word, because look at the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms is full of prayers. Go through and pray you know, some of those Psalms. Pray those prayers to God. Look at other examples in the Bible. Look at something, um, a good place to turn is, uh, look at uh, Daniel chapter number 9. Daniel chapter number 9. Here, we can see an example in, in Daniel. This was someone who had a strong prayer life. I mean, we, you want to talk about prayers being answered? Daniel was someone who had prayers answered. You know, angels came and answered his prayer. Now, they didn't always come straight away. Sometimes it took them a week or two to get through, you know? But he was someone who, who travailed in prayer. Look at this. It says, um, uh, look at verse number 2. Daniel chapter 9, verse 2. It says, In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. I mean, look, I was studying the Bible and I realized we're going to be here for 70 years. That's what he's saying. I'd studied the Bible and that's what I realized. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. So notice he was praying, but it was, he fasted as well. He had sackcloth and ashes. So in other words, he was humbling himself. Remember what did Jesus do? He fell on his face and prayed. And I prayed unto the Lord my God, and I made my confession, and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments, we have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from my precepts and from thy judgment. So what, what's a part of his prayer? Confession. Confession. Confessing to God. That's an important thing. He says, Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and to all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces. So notice, he's talking about how great God is, and at the same time he's confessing how much he comes short. Confessing how much his people come short. He says, As at this day, to the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, unto all Israel that are near and that are far off, through all countries whither thou hast driven them, because of their trespass, that they have trespassed against thee. So he understood that the bad things that happened to them had happened because of what they'd done. You know, it wasn't a coincidence that they'd gone into captivity. It wasn't just some random thing that had happened. Okay? It says, look, because of their trespass against thee. O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of face, to our kings, to our princes, to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgivenesses, though we have rebelled against him. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants the prophets. Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. So notice, he knows why these bad things have happened. And he knows, look, this is exactly what Moses wrote about. I think you preached about them. Remember the curses and the blessings. These things came upon them because of what they'd done. This is exactly what it was. And he says, and he hath confirmed his words, which he spake against us and against our judges that judged us, by bringing upon us a great evil. For under the whole heaven hath not been done, it hath been done upon Jerusalem, as it is written in the law of Moses. So notice, his prayer is fed. His prayer is guided by the scriptures, by his knowledge of the scriptures. That's very important. That's very important that we understand that when we pray, we pray in line with what God's word says. Not that we're just going off, well, I want this and I want that. No, we need to be looking and say, what, is the God, what, is the, what does the Bible say? He says, as is written in the Lord of Moses, all this evil has come upon us, yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. Therefore hath the Lord watched upon the evil and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all his works, which he doeth, for he obeyed not his voice. And now, O Lord our God, that has brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, and has gotten thee renowned as at this day. We have sinned, we have done wickedly. How much is he confessing? How much is he admitting? We're wrong. We're wrong. O Lord, according to thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers Jerusalem, and thy people have become a reproach to all that are about us. Now therefore, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant, 
and his supplications and cause thy face to shine, shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. O my God, incline thine ear and hear. Open thine eyes and behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousnesses, but for thy great mercies. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake. O my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. So notice, we can see the passion in his prayer. And when you read that, you'll start to pray the way Daniel prayed. I mean, when Jesus prayed, it doesn't sort of talk about it in this one here, but he's he sweat like a word, great drops of blood. You know, he was praying passionately. He wasn't just, you know, sitting there saying some rote prayer. You know, now I lay me down to sleep. That wasn't what he was doing. Okay? And so we should follow that example. Look back at uh, Mark chapter number 14. Look at verse number 38. Verse number 38, he, this is, Jesus says, he says, look, you couldn't watch one hour? He says, look, watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. So a great reason to pray is to escape from temptation. It's to escape from temptation. Remember we saw the, the Lord's Prayer um, in Mark chapter, Matthew chapter number 6. We sang it earlier on. Matthew chapter number 6, verse number 9. It says, after this manner therefore pray, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So he's giving glory to God in his prayer. That's what we saw Daniel do. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. Praying to God, saying, look, lead me not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So you pray to God and say, look, please, don't lead me into temptation. Deliver me from evil. Our flesh is weak, so we need God's help. We need God to help us to overcome temptation. Look back at uh, verse number 39. Verse number 39. And again he went away and prayed and spake the same words. Notice that. So he's prayed and he's, you know, come back. They're asleep. He's, woke, you know, he's woken them up and said, look, you should be praying. Couldn't you watch for one hour? And then he goes away and he prays and spake the same words. He says the same thing. So that tells me, look, it's fine to pray the same thing repeatedly. It's fine. You know, you've, you've gone through and you've prayed some things, you know, you've written down some prayers, pray them again. It's fine to pray again and again and again. Being persistent in prayer is what that's called. Being persistent in prayer. Look, if you've got Luke chapter number 18. Luke chapter number 18 and verse number 1. Luke chapter number 18 and verse number 1. It says, And he spake a parable unto them and to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. So he's saying, look, we should be praying and not doing what? Not fainting, not giving up. Saying, there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said with himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with him. So he's saying, look, imagine, think, think of this, this judge, this unjust judge, because this widow keeps on bothering him, eventually he gives what she wants, just because she's just bothering him so much. And you're saying, look, if he's going to do that, isn't God going to do that much more? And it's not that God's like the unjust judge. But what he's saying is, look, just be persistent. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. He says, And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he be along with them? I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. So here's the thing. Lack of prayer. What does that show? Lack of faith. Lack of fear. So lack of prayer equals lack of faith. Um, having said that, though, we still do need to be aware that we should avoid vain repetitions. Because if you remember when we, when we sang Matthew chapter number 6, it talked about, it says, you know, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they should be heard for their much speaking. So when they, you might, like, they might chant something over and over again. I mean, we think of, the, think of the Catholics, you know, they'll, they'll say the rosary, you know, which is not a biblical prayer at all. But they'll, they'll pray, you know, the, you know, the Lord's Prayer. They'll say that over and over again. Go and pray this ten times. No, Jesus said, use not vain repetitions. He says, he says, they think they should be heard for their much speaking. He says, no, be not ye therefore like unto them. He says, your father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask them. God already knows. You know, it's not that you need to say it again and again and again. But at the same time, we should still persist. Keep on praying. Keep on praying. Okay, look back at uh, verse number 40. Mark 14, verse number 40. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Neither wist they what to answer him. 
Um, you know, so neither wist, that, wist it's, it's one of those sort of old words when it's when they're saying he didn't that they didn't they didn't know what to answer them is what they're basically saying. You say, well, how do I know that? Well, you'll often find sometimes it talks about um, oh, I think Paul says it like what you not. And you say, what, is, what does that mean? What you not? That's like W O T. What? What does that mean? Just, well, that's the same sort of thing it's talking about here. We still use the word today. Think about the word wits. Yes. If someone's witless, they know nothing. Okay? If you've got your wits about you, you know stuff. Well, that's all it is. When it says wist, when it says what, that's what it's talking about. It's just, we don't necessarily use all the forms. A lot of, you know, the language today that we use is a lot simpler than it used to be. Go back in, you know, yeah. old English, and it's actually more, you know, there's a lot more ways of saying something. You know, there's, more, there's a lot more to it. You know, if you've, if you've learned Latin or, you know, some of those old languages, there's a lot of stuff to them. Today, we've kind of sort of dumbed down. It's, you know, it's getting even more with the sort of text language and stuff. But um, just, you know, you might, when you see that, you know what it is. When it's just saying, neither wish they what to answer them. It's just saying that they didn't know. That's all it was. Um, verse number 41. And he cometh a third time and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. It is enough. The hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. So after it happens for the third time, he tells them, sleep all you want now. He's finished praying. He's done it. He's done, he's done all the praying he's going to do. Now it's happening. And now it's time to be betrayed. Look at verse number 42. Verse number 42. Rise up and let us go. Lo, he, lo, he that betrayeth me is at hand. And immediately while he had spake, cometh Judas, one of the twelve, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. And he that betrayed him had given them a token, saying, Whomsoever shall kiss, that same as he, take him and lead him away safely. And as soon as he was come, he goeth straight away, straight away to him and saith, Master, Master, and kissed him. And they laid their hands on him and took him. So Judas, we see here, Judas comes with a multitude, he's armed, they're ready to take Jesus to the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now, when you read this account here, I mean, that's pretty much it, it seems reasonably, um, it seems to be reasonably uneventful. I mean, you will find out in some later verses, we'll find out Peter, you know, cuts someone's ear off. But apart from that, that's pretty much it, it's pretty, pretty short. But there's some interesting detail that you'll find that John includes. So keep your finger in um, Mark chapter 14, but look at John chapter number 18. John chapter number 18 Look at verse number 1. John 18 and verse number 1. <clears throat> it says, And when he had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Cedron, where was a garden into the which he entered, and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. So notice, here, well, there's no mention of the praying in the garden. You know, it's kind of just been and gone, okay? So you find, that's the thing, it's important to read all the Gospels because you get details in some that you don't get in others. Look at verse number four. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Then asked he them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore you seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spake of them which thou gavest me, have I lost none. So here we sort of see the similar sort of account. But did you notice something in here that we didn't see in Mark? When they first asked him, you know, they said, Who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. He goes, I am he. And what happened when he said that? They went backward and fell on the ground. Because one of the reasons, because obviously John, he includes um, things in his gospel which show the, the divinity of Christ. The fact that Jesus was God in the flesh. And when Jesus said, I am, I'm the one you're looking for, they went and fell on the ground. Why? Because they were words of power that Jesus spoke. Because he was the son of God, God in the flesh, on earth. Okay, We didn't notice that as we read through Mark, but that's, that's, that's what John clearly records. Okay, Turn back a few to Mark. Mark chapter number 14, look at verse number, where we get to, verse 46. And they laid hands on him and took him, verse 47. And one of them that stood by drew a sword and smote a servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. So Peter cuts off the ear of a servant of the high priest. According, if you weren't turn there, but in John, we actually find out his name was Malchus. You know, if you turn to Luke, you'll find out that Jesus actually healed his ear. You know, maybe Luke recorded that because he was a, he's a doctor, physician, so maybe that's why he was interested in that. But you know, that's why it's important. Read them all. 
Read, read all the Gospels and you piece it and it's like, oh, there's a bit of information you don't find out there. Okay? Um, look at verse number 48. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Are ye come out as against a thief with swords and with staves to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching and you took me not, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. So Jesus, what does he do? He allows himself to be taken by them in fulfillment of the scriptures. You know, it says one of them that, you know, he could have asked and there could have been 12 legions of angels could have come, you know, but the scriptures had to be fulfilled. Look at verse number 50. And they all forsook him and fled. And they all forsook him and fled. So all of Jesus' disciples, they forsake him and they flee. Okay? It's not just, it's not just Peter. They, every single one of them, they all flee. Look at verse number 51. And there followed him a certain young man having a linen cloth cast about his naked body. And the young men laid hold on him. And he left the linen cloth and fled from the naked. Now this particular detail here, this particular detail is only mentioned in the Gospel of Mark. It's only mentioned in the Gospel of Mark. Many people think, it's probably quite, quite reasonable, that Mark was the young man who was mentioned. And that would be why it was there, because he was the only one that was left. And he's including this particular detail because it's here. You say, well, why is it included? Well, of course, the other disciples had fled. They'd already fled, so they wouldn't have seen it. Maybe, I mean, maybe Mark includes this as a way of justifying why he fled. Because he's saying, look, they'd all fled, but there was still a young man that was following them. But he had, all he had was this linen cloth, and they pulled that off him, and so he takes off naked. So it's just like, well, that's why I ran away, because, you know, I had no clothes. I mean, you might wonder why he was wearing so little in the first place, okay? I mean, it says he was naked. I don't think it necessarily means that he was completely naked. I don't think he was necessarily just there, and all he had was a, you know, was a towel, or, a, you know, that's all he had, and they whipped it off and just was nude completely. Uh, because, I mean, the Bible refers to nakedness. You know, the Bible, the Bible talks about your thighs being naked. The Bible refers, I mean, people today walk up the main street of Dunedin dressed as the Bible would say, they're actually naked. Yeah. They're exposing their nakedness, you know? And it's like, and don't think, oh, well it, well, it just depends on where you are. Okay, so you go to the beach, and if, if you go to the beach, then it's okay to just, just wear your underwear on the beach. Or if you go to a swimming pool, or you, know, you dig a hole in the ground, and so all of a sudden, suddenly, it's like, yeah, it's like, I think there was an ad, we used to have a TV years ago, and <laughs> they haven't had one for a long time, but there was an ad, was it someone walking along, and it's like, they're, what are they, they're like they're, their the, the undies, and then they become speedos, they become hogs or something, depending on where you are. It doesn't change. It doesn't change. Speedos are rude wherever you are. <laughs> undies, wherever you are, okay? The st- hey, why yeah. that, that example also about in the Bible, wasn't it, talking about Peter being in the fishing boat? Yep. And says that he let down the water. So presumably he, had, he still had a... a yeah, for sure. Down. Yeah, he, he said it was... Not, and so he put, a, he put something on, he put a cloak or yeah, something on. Been, but he wasn't... Yeah, he was exactly. He would have just been... He probably had his speedos on. Maybe he did. Maybe he did. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> anyway, let's move on. But here's the thing. I mean, a lot of people are naked and they don't even realise. You know? I mean, Jesus said that in, um, in Revelation. Revelation chapter number two. Isn't that what he said to one of the... Oh, Re- Revelation three, excuse me. He says... Um, yeah, Revelation 3.17. He says, Because thou sayest I am rich and increased in goods, with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. There are people who are naked, they're blind, they're miserable, and they don't think they are. They don't think they are. Anyway, back in Mark chapter number 14. Mark chapter number 14. Verse number 53. And they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him were assembled all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes. And Peter followed him afar off, even unto the palace of the high priest. And he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. So they lead Jesus, Jesus away to the high priest. Peter follows from a distance. You might sort of wonder, you know, think about this. How closely are we following Jesus? Are we following from a distance? Or are we up close? How could you tell? You know, there's a great verse in 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. It says, Yea, and all that will of godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You want to know, are you following Jesus closely? Are you living a godly life? Well, how about this? Are you suffering persecution? Are people persecuting you? Are people persecuting you because of what you believe? Not just because you're obnoxious, you know, but just because, because you stand for what's right. You stand for what the Bible says. You say, look, I think that, you know, according to the Bible... Drinking alcohol is a sin. I want nothing to do with it. Okay? Now, it's fine for people to have their views, and that's fine. But a lot of people think, okay, well, but I like drinking alcohol. And so when someone doesn't want anything to do with it, they get offended by that. They get offended by that. Okay? And they, they'll 
the Bible says they'll cast out your name as evil. You know? Um, anyway, let's move on. Verse number verse number 55. Verse number 55. And the chief priests and all the council sought for witness against Jesus to put him to death and found none. For many bear false witness against him, but their witness agreed not together. And there arose certain and bear false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But neither so did their witness agree together. So what we see here, they're desperately seeking witnesses against Jesus. Why? Because they're trying to convict him. Yeah. They're trying to convict him. To say, look, he's done something wrong. Because what, what, they, they, remember, they wanted to put him to death. They wanted to put him to death. They wanted to put Lazarus to death. People were believing on him, and they wanted to kill him so that the Romans didn't come and take away their nation. And so they, they've, they've already made up their minds. So they're not really, it's not that they need evidence. They're not really looking for evidence. They're just looking for people that are going to say something because they, to, to do what they've already decided they're going to do. And it's kind of like, I mean, they have it a lot of workplaces or, 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 and you know, governments and councils have the same sort of thing. You know, have this sort of, you know, we're going to make like a process of change. You know, what's going to happen? And, and so we need to get everyone's input and everyone's feedback. We need to find out so we can decide and then we're going to take action. But they go through that and they spend lots. And the consultants will come in and all that sort of stuff that happens. And yet, more often than not, they already know exactly what they're going to do. They already know who they're going to fire, where the cuts are going to be made, how this is going to be slashed here and there. They've already decided. But they go through all this other stuff of wasting all this money and then do what they were going to do anyway. And often you'll find it, it comes out you know, and things get leaked out and you discover, oh, that was already, it was, it was you know, a fate accompli. It was already finished. They already knew. Well, it's the same thing with here. They already knew. They already had him convicted. But they were just wanting someone to say something. So, yeah, yeah, now we know. Now we know. Look at verse number, verse number 60. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Answer us thou nothing. What is it which these witness against thee? But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? So, you know, finally, the high priest comes. He accuses Jesus directly. And so what does Jesus say? Verse 62. And Jesus said, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. So the high priest accuses Jesus. Jesus tells him the truth. He answered. Did you want to know if I am? Am I the Christ? Yes, I am. I am the Christ. And of course, there you go. That's enough. That's enough to convict him. Verse number 60. Verse number 63, then the high priest rent his clothes and said, what need we any further witnesses? You've heard the blasphemy. What think ye? And they all condemned him to be guilty of death. So he says, are you the Christ? He says, yes. And okay, there you go. He's guilty. But maybe he is the Christ. I mean, we know that he is the Christ. But that's enough. That's enough to convict him in their eyes. When he admits the truth that he is the Christ, that he is the Son of God, that's it. He's guilty. He's worthy of death. Verse number 65, and some began to spit on him and to cover his face, and to buffet him, and to say unto him, prophesy. And the servants did strike him with the palms of their hands. So they start abusing him. They start abusing him verbally. They start abusing him physically. This is exactly what Jesus said would happen. This is exactly what Jesus said would happen. Look at Luke chapter number 18. Luke chapter number 18, and verse number 31. Because this is all in fulfillment of Scripture. And this is all in fulfillment. Jesus knew what would happen. Look at verse number 31. And he took unto him the twelve, and said unto him, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on. And they shall scourge him, and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. And they understood none of these things, and this saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. So this is, this is exactly what Jesus said would happen. He said, and now it was being fulfilled. Verse number 66. And as Peter was beneath in the palace, there cometh one of the maids of the high priest. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked upon him and said, And thou also was with Jesus of Nazareth. So Peter follows to see what's going to happen. One of the maids thinks, Hang on, I recognize you. I've seen you before somewhere. Verse number 68. But he denied, saying, I know not, neither understand I what thou sayest. And he went out into the porch, and the cock crew. So Peter denies, saying, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. And as soon as he does, what happens? The cock crows. Which, that really should have reminded him what Jesus said back in verse number 30. If you look back at verse number 30, it said in verse 30, And Jesus saith unto him, verily, because remember Peter said, 
he said, even though everyone denies you, I, nevertheless, I won't deny you. Jesus saith him, verily I say unto thee, that this day, even in this night, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. So Jesus told him, that before the cock crows twice, what are you going to do? You're going to deny me. So here, he's denied him, and then the cock crows. That should have really triggered his memory. The, um, but it doesn't. It doesn't. Now, some people say, look, hang on a second. Is this a contradiction that's in the Bible? Because if you look at, um, keep your finger in Mark 14, but look at Matthew 26, for example. Matthew chapter number 26. Look at Matthew 26 and verse number 34. Matthew chapter number 26 and verse number 34. It says, Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. So here it's just saying, just before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. And then in verse number um, 75, look down at verse number 75, or verse number 74, and he began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man, and immediately the cock crew. And Peter remembered the word which Jesus said unto him, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. So here's the thing. Some people say, look, this is a contradiction, is it? Because one of them saying, look, the cock, before the cock crows twice, you're going to deny me three times. And here, the other one's just saying, it's before the cock crows. Well, here's the thing. When you compare them all, and look at Matthew and Luke and John, those three Gospels, they all record Jesus telling Peter, look, you'll deny me three times before the cock crows. Before the cock crows, you'll deny me three times. Matthew and Luke, they also mention the fact that when the cock crows, Jesus looks at Peter, and Peter weeps. But Mark is the one who actually gives us the most detail. He says, before the cock crows twice, so he actually records an extra cock crow, which happened much earlier. Because if we look, if we look at um, Luke chapter 22, look at Luke chapter 22, verse number 54, Luke chapter 22, and verse number 54, Luke chapter 22, verse number 54, it says, Then took they him, and led him, and brought him into the high priest's house, and Peter followed afar off. And when they kindled a fire in the midst of the hall, and were set down together, Peter sat down among them. But a certain maid beheld him as he sat by the fire, and earnestly looking upon him, said, This man also was with him. And he denied him, saying, Woman, I know him not. Now that's where, in Mark, you then see, that's where a cock crows. But it's not mentioned here. And after a little while, another saw him and said, Thou art also of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. And about the space of one hour after, another confidently affirmed, saying, Of a truth, this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately, while yet spake, the cock crew. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter, and Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Yeah. So notice, here's the thing. The difference is basically, Mark goes into very great detail, whereas in Matthew and Luke and John, they just refer to the cock crow. Because it's like, it's like the cock crow, it's like how you'd say, you know, it's the, it's the morning, it's the dawn. You know, when, when is it the cock, that's when they do. You know, they all start crowing, okay? And so they're just talking in general. Mark records specifically before the cock crows twice. And then he also records this like the stray rooster that does this early crow. So when Peter does his first denial, immediately there's a crow. And yet it's not an, an hour late. Now the roosters crow and crow. I mean, we've lived on a farm, but they crow for a bit. But they don't just keep going on and on and on and on. Not for hours and hours. Okay? And so it's an hour later before you get more cocks so that crowing. Okay? And so... Mark records just that specific, this is exactly what happens. So he does the first denial, and there's a cock crow. But then later on, he does another denial. And then later on, like an hour later, he does the third denial, and that's when it's you know, the final one, and then he realises. Then he realises, and what does he do? He weeps bitterly. So it's not that it's a contradiction. Mark's just much more detailed. The other ones are just talking about this general cock crowing time. Look at verse number 69. Verse number 69. And a maid saw him again and began to say unto him that stood by, This is one of them. And he denied it again. And a little after that, they that stood by said again to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thou art a Galilean, and thy speech agreeeth thereto. Verse number 71. But he began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not this man of whom he speak. So notice here, as Peter is doing something he shouldn't be doing. He's, I mean, should he be denying Jesus? No. He shouldn't be denying Jesus. But when he's doing that, people draw attention to the fact what does he do? He starts getting really angry. He starts getting really angry. He starts cursing and swearing. You know, it kind of relates to that sort of the, the, the don't judge me attitude that so many people have. You see, when someone is doing what is wrong, they can tend to get really angry when someone points it out. Why are you doing that? Why are you doing what's wrong? It's like, hey, don't you judge me. 
And Peter's like, you know, hey, don't you know him? No, no. And, and the, the more they press him, eventually he gets really wild. He spits the dummy. He starts cursing and swearing and carrying on. Look at verse number 72. And the second time the cock crew. And Peter called to mind the word that Jesus said unto him, Before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. And when he thought thereon, he wept. So what Jesus said, to ha- said would happen, it came to pass. It came to pass. And when Peter realised what he had done, he wept. Now that's not the end of the story for Peter. In John 21, we won't turn there, but in John 21, after his resurrection, Jesus comes and asks Peter three times. And he says, lovest thou me? He says, Peter, do you love me? Lovest thou me? And Peter's like, you know I love you. And what does Jesus say? Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Now it wasn't a coincidence that Peter denied Jesus three times, and then Jesus three times says, do you love me? Yes, I do. Do you love me? Yes, I do. Do you love me? Yes, I do. And each time, he says, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. He tells them, look, you love me. How about you show it? Jesus said, you know, um, to his disciples in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. He's saying to, to Peter, do you love me? Yes, okay, then feed my sheep. Serve me. Do, do what you're supposed to do. Show your love for me by serving faithfully. You know, he hasn't written Peter off. Even though Peter denied him, Jesus gives him this chance to show himself, to, to do what's right, you know, to, 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 fix up, to fix up the mess that he's made. You know, it's the thing, a lot of people, they, they, they do things that are wrong. It's, oh, well, that's it, it's all over. No, it doesn't have to be all over. The Bible says, you know, whoso covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Confess them and forsake them, and you'll have mercy. Now, this is not talking about, you know, Getting eternal salvation, you've got to be saved, you've got to confess your sins, and, and people go through all that, you know. In fact, they'll even use the, the example from, from Matthew chapter number 6. For if you forgive your, you know, if you forgive me and your, your, their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. And they use that, say, you have to forgive. And if someone's done something against you, you know, someone's done some wicked thing against you, if you don't forgive them, you're on your way to hell. You've got to forgive everyone, absolutely everything. Now, should we forgive? You know, Jesus said, if your brother comes and says, look, I repent, then forgive him, Absolutely. But that's got nothing to do with you being saved. Because he says, look, if you forgive me, you know, forgive me in your trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you forgive not me in your trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. The notice says, your Father. That means, that's just talking about someone who's saved. That's just talking about someone who's saved. Because the Bible says, you're all the children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. When someone's saved, they believe they're saved, God becomes their Father. You see, God's not the Father of the unsaved. He's not. He's the father of the saved. So it's saying, well, what's this talking about that God's not forgive? What it means is when we don't forgive, you know, your brother or your sister, they do something wrong, and they come and come to you and repent, say, I'm sorry, and you refuse to forgive, what does that mean? If you don't forgive them, then God is going to hold the things that you've done wrong against you. Because you've done plenty of wrong things. Don't you need God to forgive you for that? Yeah, that's true. If you're saved, you're not going to go to hell. But guess what? God will chastise you. God will punish you for the wrong things you do in this life. And if you're unforgiving, he's going to punish you for every wrong thing that you do. Because that's, that's what it says. If you don't forgive, your father's not going to forgive. And he's going to hold it all against you. He's going to hold, why? Because he wants you to become forgiving. He wants you to be, be like him. Be merciful the same way that he's merciful. Be forgiving the same way that he is forgiven. So what we've seen in this chapter, we've seen, just in summary... We saw, remember at the start, Jesus got anointed by Mary in preparation for his upcoming death. That was a couple of weeks ago, that's it started. And what happened? Judas objected to what Mary did. Didn't he? He objected. He said, look, this money should have been sold and given to the poor. And of course, Jesus said, hey, look, let her alone. She's, what she's done is fine. You know, Judas takes the pip at that and then goes off and betrays him. And so it's, it's quite ironic. I mean, he's worried about this little supposed transgression that Mary's done. But of course it was hers. She had the right to do what she wanted with her own. Yeah. And yet contrast with, with about what he's about to do. You know, often people who are guilty of great big sins will be, point, will be trying to point at the finger at little ones. It's kind of like what Jesus talked about, about, the, about the, 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 you know, looking at the moat in your brother's eye and not worrying about the beam that's in your own eye. Judas, he had a great big beam. And he was trying to say, let, let Mary, you've got this wee moat we can clear up. No, I mean, in fact, Jesus said to Judas, it would be better for him if he'd never been born. I mean, the most grievous sin that anyone could commit to betray the sinless, spotless lamb, lamb of God. What else do we see in this chapter? All the disciples, what they do? They forsake Jesus. They forsake Jesus. 
And Peter, he denies him repeatedly. I guess something we can really learn from this is to say, look, would we have done any better than them? If all his disciples forsook him, if Peter denied him, would we have done any better? You know, it says in, um, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, verse 12, it says, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed, lest he fall. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed, lest he fall. You think you're doing great. I would never fall into that sort of sin. The Bible says, be careful, lest you fall. Realise that we're capable of doing the same, the same things that we see other people, wicked sins we see other people doing. Realise we're capable of falling into that. Yeah. In fact, the very next verse says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But then it says, But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. So look, we're going to be tempted, but it's not beyond what you're able. There's a way to bear it. There's a way to escape it. I wonder what that could be. What did Jesus say? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Watch and pray. We should be taking time to pray. Jesus was the example. He prayed all night. He prayed for an hour. Came back, they were asleep. Went away and prayed again, the same thing. Probably took another hour. Came back, they were asleep. We should be following Jesus' example, praying, so we don't fall into temptation. And make sure, obviously, that our, that our prayer, it's informed by Scripture. We saw that with Daniel. Remember, didn't we see what he was praying? He understood things by books and he was praying. This is what happened. This is what Moses said. This is what we did. We should have our prayer should be not just you know vain babbling, but we should be earnestly, from the heart, praying to God. There was a, a, like a, an acronym I, I learned years and years ago, which can be a helpful thing when it comes to praying, is the, the acronym ACTS. Everyone's familiar with the book of ACTS? A-C-T-S. The first one, the A stands for adoration. And notice in Daniel's prayer, you know, the Lord's prayer, it's to, you know, it's about praying, God, how wonderful you are. You know, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And then obviously confession, we saw, you know, remember Daniel, he's confessing his sins, confessing the sins of his people. Confessing, adoration, confessing, thanksgiving. And this is a great attitude to have. Have the attitude of thanksgiving. You want to avoid being depressed, being heavy, being down? Think about the things to be grateful for. We've all got things to be grateful for. Thanking God for those things each and every day. What can you thank him for? And then the last one is supplication. Supplication. And that's when you're asking God for things. So once you've, you know, given God the glory he deserves, once you've confessed your sins, once you've been thankful for all you've got, then ask God for something. That's a good order to have it. Acts. A-C-T-S. Anyway, let's, um, let's close in a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, we thank you once again for your word. I, I just pray you'd um, help each one of us to have a better prayer life. There's not, there's not one person alive that couldn't have a better prayer life. Help us to pray more. Help us to pray for each other. Just like the Apostle Paul. Brethren, pray for us. Lord, help us to pray. Help us to be fervent in prayer. Just like Daniel was fervent in prayer. The Bible says, The effectual fervent prayer of a, of a righteous man availeth much. And Lord, help us to have effectual prayer. Help us to have fervent prayer. Help us to be righteous people. People that are doing what's right. Understanding that it's not our own righteousness. But that you want us to show our love for you by being obedient. We thank you and praise you and love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs>